All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. And welcome to today's webinar. I think we have a great, great topic and some esteemed hosts. And um, the topic today is AR, AI and rules engines in healthcare, uh, improving decisions and patient outcomes. So if you're dialing in from like the UK or Singapore, you might, I don't know, you might want to pass on this one. You might be a bit shocked at how the US healthcare system works between payers and providers. Um, but if, if, if not, then uh, I think you'll learn a lot today from our hosts. And uh, also it's an exciting time with the advancements in AI and we're all trying to figure out how we can take what's good, apply it to the healthcare system uh, and make that, make that better for everyone, patients, payers, providers. Um, and to talk about this today, we have a great uh, panel. Let me introduce you to um, my co-host today. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Beth Myers. Beth is an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. She's a, a nurse. She's an Army veteran. She's had experience you know, on the floor with patients. She also has a PhD in uh, health informatics, uh, so very well-rounded. Uh, background and experience. Welcome, Beth. I'd also like to introduce you to Krish Parathamon. Uh, Krish is the Vice President and Practice Head uh, of Implementations and Services and RPA at Sidious Tech. Welcome, Krish. Uh, and uh, myself, I'm the Chief Operating Officer. I'm Gordon Jones. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Decisions. Um, not quite as educated as my colleagues, but um, uh, I've been with Decisions seven years. I was a customer prior to that, um, and we should have an interesting conversation today. Um, first, some housekeeping. We have some upcoming uh, training events, live training events on the Decisions platform. Uh, Mid-September, we just had an event uh, last week, in fact, in Denver, um, coming up mid-September at our headquarters in Virginia Beach, we have a three-day training event where you'll learn all about uh, the decisions platform. And then mid-October, we will be back in Singapore our, for our Asia-Pacific uh, client base. And we also have some additional webinars coming up uh, next month in August. We have a webinar on supercharging your business processes beyond Excel. So the platform, we have a lot of capability to import, export um, Excel documents and, and do all kinds of things. You'll find that very interesting. Uh, and then later on at the end of August, we have uh, one of our customers um, also presenting an insurance, um, insurance centric webinar, automating claims billing using AI. Um, so there's a lot of parallels to what we'll be talking about today. Um, but they've they've incorporated AI and the rules engine and the decisions platform in automating uh, claims processing. We also have uh, several webinars that are that are um, applicable here. You can or or rather white papers, I should say, are white papers 
are on our website at decisions.com forward slash white papers. Uh, we have an automating AI white paper. Uh, we have another white paper on the decisions platform and HL7 and using fire. Um, I'll talk a, a bit later about why that's so important in terms of integrating with all of the various systems in healthcare. Uh, there's tons of them. I think Beth had once told me that the the average hospital, I think, has something like 5,000 software applications. Um, so there's all kinds of things that need to be integrated. HL7 and FHIR are the, are the are core to that. Um, Chris, tell us about the upcoming events that uh, Sidious Tech has. Hey, thanks, Gordon. Um, as industry is moving uh, towards uh, Gen AI, and we, uh, as we, as a company, CTS Tech, you know, focused on healthcare, you know, doing a lot of investments in uh, Gen AI space. And we have a couple of uh, uh, webinars coming up, uh, one in August, Gen AI in Action, where we see the real world scenarios on healthcare uh, transformation initiatives. We see a lot of customers come to us asking for you know, can we do a POC in the you know, Gen AI space? So we kind of help uh, solving those problems uh, through POC, which turn into actual actions. And also we have another webinar coming up uh, on connected care. And um, apart from these two webinars in August, there are uh, plenty of events. Uh, you know, we you know specialize in healthcare. So a lot of healthcare events that is being uh, conducted from CTS Tech standpoint, which is available ctstech.com slash events. Feel free to register and, and kind of, uh, there are a lot of exciting Events coming up there. All right, thanks, Krish. Um, and did you want to talk a bit, also, Krish, about Sidious Tech itself? Sure, I definitely, got And so, Sidious uh, Tech, uh, we uh, primarily focus on uh, healthcare consulting, IT. So, uh, pretty much, we uh, do only business with high, uh, healthcare. When I say healthcare, you know, healthcare uh, within our company includes. Uh, life sciences and um, medtech uh, devices as well. Um, so we are uh, IT consulting leader in this space, just because like our niche skills, you know, we, like I said, we focus only on healthcare and then we are backed by two major in, uh, private equity companies, Bain and Capital and then BPEA. And uh, any major uh, healthcare payer provider or medtech companies or even uh, life sciences space, you know, any major uh, companies that you have, we have uh, some form of presence in that helping our customers uh, in seeing value through our IT consulting. So what that means is like from a CDS tech standpoint, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, Gordon, please. So uh, we, we are um, organized uh, by four verticals. Um, that brings in focus on payer, provider, medtech and life sciences. And our offerings are spread across, you know, pretty much IT consulting and advisory services. And uh, especially, you know, uh, decisions is something that falls under implementation services, which um, uh, I had the implementation services focusing on low code and RPA. All right, thanks, Krish. Um, now for a bit about decisions. Decisions is a no code process automation platform uh, with a rule engine, a uh, flow engine. There's five pieces to our platform. I won't spend too much time uh, talking about the various uh, five pieces, but predominantly we're involved in decision automation. Um, and uh, the rule engine is the heart of the platform. And the whole idea here is to take business logic out of custom code, out of stored procedures, and put it in a place that can be easily understood by, uh, I'll say, users or subject matter experts, such that they can understand the decisioning, the rules, and perhaps even edit and maintain those rules. Uh, so we do a lot of work in medical claims processing in the insurance industry in general, um, as well as uh, uh, verticals like uh, loan origination. Um, additionally, you know, we sit beside the large, um, large platforms like SAP, like the, the healthcare platforms, and uh, we manage special processes, special decision automation, uh, where you have uh, a process where you don't want to custom code your large transaction system, but rather offload the, uh, the logic 
the customization uh, to a platform like Decisions. Um, and finally, what I'd say is um, Decisions where we call ourselves on orchestration engine. So we sit between the cracks, like for example, in healthcare, we sit between the cracks of a lot of uh, other software applications to integrate, to add business logic in between to, to, to allow for that full automation uh, when it sits between the cracks. So I've had CTOs tell me, hey, I have all my big bricks. What I need is, is something in between to manage integrations and automation. And that's really where decision sits. Um, but to, to really understand the platform, um, I'd highly recommend if you're interested to uh, reach out for a, a, a demo, custom demo. You can, you can find decisions at sales at decisions.com um, or reach out to info at sidiustech.com to talk to the healthcare experts and technologists at Sidious Tech. Um, if during this uh, webinar, if you have any questions, by all means, you know, at the bottom of your screen, you'll find a little chat window or a Q&A window. Uh, we'll, we'll be answering those throughout or um, certainly at the end. Um, so today's agenda, um, you know, we could start with, there'll be a few questions we'll walk through, you know, the need for AI in healthcare. Uh, what, what are the exciting things happening today? Um, then we'll discuss, you know, why, why having a rules engine is important and AI enabled AI powered rules engine and how AI and rules can work together to both improve outcomes and to provide automation in our, in our very, very manual healthcare space as it is today. Um, then we're going to talk a bit about optimizing, you know, revenue cycle management and the claims processing using these tools. Uh, at that point, we will turn it over to Tim Stahl, us, uh, who leads our sales engineering team here at Decisions and has a live AI-enabled demo to show you um, how that can work within a claims management system. Um, and then we'll, we'll cover, we'll end with some Q&A and some final discussion. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started in the discussion. Um, so I have a, you know, a couple questions for our esteemed panel here. Um, so to begin, um, uh, maybe we'll start off a question for Beth. Beth, uh, you know, what are the trends, emerging technology, emerging technologies and uh, predictions for healthcare digital transformation that you see coming in the market today? Thanks, Gordon. I am happy to be back speaking with you and Decisions customers, first of all. And uh, I think that AI is one of those top emerging trends in healthcare today. We um, know from our analysts that AI is on the top of the hype cycle for healthcare. And if you attended HIMSS, which is the largest um, health informatics society within healthcare, the conference last year, all the booths were filled with AI and we're thinking just as every other industry, how can we incorporate AI into healthcare? And when I think about AI in healthcare, I think about probabilities versus certainty. And so I'm excited to have some discussion today about how the rules engine can help with AI um, and providing some trust and account um, trust and assurances for using this AI in high stake settings like in healthcare talk a little bit, it's a little bit about my background. I really think AI is um, one of those leading areas for the emerging trends in healthcare in general. Uh, Krish, what are your thoughts about that? Um, yeah, so with respect to digital transformation, I have a couple of areas that uh, we are observing where uh, the industry is trending towards more of tele telehealth expansion. We see that you know, kicked up real fast, like after the COVID era. And, um, you know, from digital transformation perspective, like we can bring in a lot of, um, you know, uh, we can reduce a lot of burdens on the uh, healthcare facilities by, you know, enabling more providers into getting into tele telehealth consultation. And then the other area that we are seeing is uh, where really AI come into place value-based uh, healthcare. 
And there is a shift recently we are seeing from fee-for-service to value-based care models that focus on patient outcomes and the cost effectiveness, right? We know that every year healthcare cost sky, uh, is skyrocketing and then obviously there is a constant pressure from the plans. How do we reduce the cost effectiveness? And that's where we think, uh, that's where we see that digital transformation efforts would help uh, reduce the cost. You know, one such area that we are seeing is the population health management. So we have the data available for uh, for the members, like you know the, the clinical data and the claim data. There is a wide group of people needing care, you know, where we can, you know, kind of identify them and using the predictive modeling and then try to get them into an engagement of more of taking, you know, timely care and things like that. So we can definitely reduce the uh, reduce the cost. So those are a couple of areas where digital transformation, especially the technology of uh, AI and then Gen AI coming up is going to help transforming the healthcare industry. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'll have to remember to pull in some AI. I'm teaching a population health informatics course this fall. And we talk a lot about how to wrangle that data and AI is a great tool to wrangle that data. Yeah. All right. And then in, in, there is another thing that I forgot to mention is about the interoperability, right? When it comes to the care coordination, uh, that is another area, right? Where we have common standards. The garden talked about the HL7, right? That is really key. You know, we like you were also mentioning like 5,000 systems in a major health in a delivery system that you could see, like they have to talk to each other, not only internally, but also you know, talk to uh, plants and different providers where, you know, this uh, coordination of you know coordination of care becomes a crucial thing. So that is another area where technology can really influence and bring in uh, you know seamless interoperability across the providers, where you know where it, it it leads to a better patient outcomes. If that makes sense. Yeah, I I'll just have one last comment, Gordon. And I'll let you move us on, but that. Um, it shocks me every time when I hear stories about um, paper still in healthcare. So before we even get into AI, we have to complete this digital transformation of getting the entire, um, everything automated within healthcare. So we need to get the data into an electronic format. And then that format needs to be standardized by adopting those HL7 standards. Um, and interesting enough, there's a group called BPM um, Health Plus who has joined HL7 in the last year to standardize the rules we use for quality so we can provide some standardization, not only on the data side and the interoperability side, but also in the rules that we're using to um, make sure that we're getting the best care for our entire population. So there's a lot of exciting things happening in that digital transformation space, Gordon. Yeah, and actually you bring up a great point, Beth, in that, you know, I think we've all been amazed at the power of these uh, large language models. You know, if you think back, you know, to a year ago, March, I think GPT-4 was released. And uh, I mean, myself, I use it every day uh, doing this and that or the other thing. Um, but it actually, if you look at over the last year, how much real automation has taken place, I would say it's fairly small, right? Uh, we've just now seen the... Uh, fruits of a lot of labor and figuring out how do you best apply this in automation, right? And you bring up a great point with the paper. And I think that's actually one area where there's a great use case here. Um, you know, we've all asked questions of these models and we've all seen the hallucinations, but there's something called uh, retrieval augmented generation or RAG for short, where the model is really only used as a query tool against a specific healthcare policy, against a specific document, right? And you're asking questions of the LLM against a document. So I think I think this generative AI has the great capability of taking a lot of, of shortcutting the conversion of paper-based documents and digitizing them because it's actually very good at pulling information out of documents uh, and putting it in a digital format and categorizing it and putting the right JSON structure, the right data structure, such that it can then be part of a digital uh, automation process. Um, so I just want to point out that this, this, this RAG capability 
um, is using the LLMs more as a query tool or, or as a series of SQL statements rather than asking the model uh, what to do. So I think it, it, we're all learning how best to apply it. And, and this is where I'm seeing the best results to date. Anything to add, Hirsch, before we move on? Um, one thing, if uh, I may add here, um, so I see uh, lots of people now talking about uh, personalized care, right? With the, with the identified population, we can get to a level of uh, engaging AI to look at the data and then predict on what's coming up based on the data and uh, curing or you know setting up for better care is another thing that I'm hearing, Gordon. All right, very good. I think, you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, rule engines, and I think um, I just want to spend a minute to to educate those who are not aware of what a rule engine is. And it's basically, um, it's a graphical design tool to to take rules out of custom code, like you might see on the left, right, and put it in a graphical user interface to make it easy for subject matter experts to look at the rules, to understand the rules, to edit them and maintain them. Uh, I think you'd all agree if you look at the structure on the right, um, it's a lot easier to understand what a um, you know dosage table uh, looks like or, or can be maintained versus trying to find it in the code and work with a, a programmer to update a rule, for example. And in the healthcare space, if you are if you are a um, if you're a, a provider or you're submitting claims and you, you know, there are rule tables for how to make a claim look good such that a specific payer will pay that claim, right? And everybody has different uh, uh, tweaks on how they want things worded, uh, structured in the claim to be paid. And so thus you need a lot of rules to, to if you want to automate uh, your claims process, right? So rules are super heavy in the healthcare space. And this is why you would rather have a, graph a rule engine to manage those versus uh, having to, to change code every time you want to update a rule. Yeah, and I'll just jump in on that, Gordon, to say that in um, if we're using something like AI machine learning in other settings is different than healthcare. We know that AI is all about, again, probabilities. And in healthcare, we need certainty. So we need to be able to view those rules and understand what AI is suggesting so we can have certainty that we are now prescribing the right medication for the right patient. It can't, we have to have that layer of certainty and something like a rules table, like you just showed, um, provides a way for AI or someone suggesting the rules to have a user interface that a clinical expert can look at and review before we put those suggestions into action for a particular patient to make sure that we're providing the best care. Yeah, that's a great point, Beth. And I'd, I'd also say combining AI with a rules engine, right? Uh, for example, we're working with another insurance company uh, I referenced earlier. And the output of the rules that go into the claim, the actual uh, invoice, for example, you know, there's specific wording. You don't want the AI model creating different text every time it's it's creating a new invoice for you, right? But if you if you ask the AI to pick the appropriate rule to provide the right text into the claim, that's a perfect use case where you you have specific text specific claims, specific document, and you're using the rules to generate the output, for example. Um, so the two working hand in hand are better than, than, than either independently. Yeah, and we're talking a lot about um, operational workflow and administrative workflow, and those are two of the largest areas where AI is being used today in healthcare. IDC is a leading industry analyst. They just came up with a taxonomy and they said there's five categories where AI is being used. And workflow are three of those categories, clinical, administrative, and operational workflow. 
Um, and when we think about workflow, we're managing the rules of where something goes next and what happens next, which is where a rules engine um, comes uh, works hand in hand with AI really well. Um, Chris, tell us a little bit more about how it works in specifically in the claims process. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to um, operations, right, claim uh, claims denial. Uh, Ratio is an important thing, you know, with respect to revenue cycle management, as we are aware. Um, so every provider that we talk to, so how do we reduce the claim rejection? How can we do that? You know, it's a massive manual effort goes in. So that's where we see rules in general shine. You know, like what, what Gordon was mentioning uh, in the sense like, those days are gone manually, go and write an EFS condition and make the rules work. Now, Rules are generated on the fly. You know, we can with the with the AI infusion in it, right? And we can use the predictive uh, analytics to kind of understand the pattern, understand the context, and then try to build the rules on the go so that it gets applied on the claims. So that's where we see industry is moving. That's where uh, rules engine really shine and understand the rules that needs to be applied from the denied claims and gets applied on the, as an edit or a business rule, which kind of prevents happening next, so thereby reducing the claims denial, denials overall for the provider. So that's where we see, um, you know, rules engine shine with AI and uh, you know, making decisions on the go uh, with the patterns that they see. Right. And and to to just follow up on that, Krish, like the I mean the another advantage to a rule engine is that it provides an audit trail, right? And when you're when you're trying to understand why something happened, you can always go back and explain which rules were triggered, why the final outcome was this. Whereas this is the big disadvantage of a large language model, right? If you ask it how it came up with the the result, it's not going to know, <sighs> right? It, it it might spew some text at you, but uh, you you wouldn't know. So, but you combining the large language model to generate the rules, then you have the rules to run against a claim, right? And you have the audit trail, and you have a clear definition of what rules were triggered, why the outcome was what it was. So again, uh, you're you're getting the best of both. Um, this might be a good time to to actually see something, um, an example of of what process. How, how you can combine AI with a rule engine. Um, so, and Tim will Tim will present that to us, but before we get there, Krish, maybe you can set the table a bit to explain what we're about to see. Sure, Gordon. Uh, this is one of the uh, scenarios that we keep uh, hearing from our customers that, you know, like I was mentioning before, how do we reduce the claim denials that we see? You know, obviously from plan standpoint, right? Their claims adjudication uh, engine is also kind of coming up with lots of edits and rules and all that, right? To kind of make sure that there is no fraudulent activity and there is no, uh, you know, putting through the claims twice or thrice and things like that. And making sure that the claims are, there is no wastage in processing uh, this claim. So, so this particular situation that what we are, uh, what we were looking at is more of, um, how do we reduce the uh, claims by uh, claim denials by using rules engine? And it's not by building the uh, uh, edits manually, but once we submit the claims to the plan, and then once it gets processed, how do we make sense out of the denied data? And then have a tool like a rule uh, decisions as a rules engine, learn the rules and apply those rules uh, for the new submission. That's the cycle that we are talking about. You know, after the denial, how AI learns the whole data and then makes sense out of it and come up with the pattern of these are the top four, five, ten rules that we are seeing that that should be that should be in place for the new claim submission to making sure that we you know we we send the claims with with the right uh, accuracy with the with the correct data. So that's what we are talking about. So these are some of the um, claim denial reasons that has been taken into account uh, to to uh, to kind of better understand why this is happening and some of the things that we see 
um, in the in the some of the things that we see uh, are already taken care by the initial edits. But however, you know this is a constant learning process for the LLM to better understand and uh, come up with uh, two categories. Essentially, this is the end goal that we wanted to achieve on uh, AI suggest and AI correct. AI suggest is more of less probability or less number of claims falling into that category, and then AI correct is more of like. 80 to 90 percent probability that you know this business rule should be in place. So you know the way that the solution uh, kind of we are envisioning is moving towards AI suggest and AI correct, where AI correct eventually gets to the process of learning this adaptive roles and applying it on the go, and then AI suggest is more of routing the uh, claims that has to be manually edited for right billing course, right taxonomy, and things like that. So. That's what we are looking at. So I will, uh, at this point, I'll hand it over to Tim uh, to kind of go through the demo with for us. Tim. All right, thanks, Krish. All right, I will stop sharing. And turn it over to Tim Stahl. All right. <clears throat> so yeah, to, to build on, on what we've been talking about today, you know, what you're seeing in front of you here is a system that was actually built uh, on the decisions platform for looking at just this specific uh, use case. And so in this case, you can see we have a, a list of claims in front of us here that have been routed through the system uh, to a payer to actually be processed and, and have that, that payment remitted to us. Um, each one of these claims through here has got things like the, the payer name on it, some very uh, high level patient data. So we know, you know who they are, what their applicable health coverage is, and, and then what the data submission is and what status it's in. And for each one of these, there's a set of rules that has been built in decisions using uh, not only industry best practice, but some AI suggestions that we have gotten along the way as we're continuously improving upon this as the claims are, are routed through the system. So for each one of these, you'll notice that there's a, a certain color associated with that particular claim where red are 75% probability and above that they're going to be denied, right? So we, we stopped it before it was sent in. So someone can review that, take action on it, correct it, and then send that through so we don't have that potential loss of revenue due to something we could have easily rectified for before uh, submitting it. The uh, yellow is, is very similar. Those are a, a lesser amount of probability uh, between 50 and 75%. So we know that this one's definitely going to be denied, and these ones have a pretty high chance of it. Now, for each of these, if we were to take a look at this second one here, you can see this list on the bottom that's actually showing the rules that were executed on that claim as it was sent through the system, and then the probability of failure should it actually have not passed that particular rule. So this one's very straightforward, right? The insured ID didn't exist. <laughs> um, we don't know who they are if the payer can't tell who it's, uh, you know, which person to bill it to or which uh, insurance to send it to. Of course, that's, that's gonna be kicked out pretty quickly. Um, and you could keep seeing as we go through these, there are other rules that were fired off. You know, do they have the applicable health coverage or in the list? Are they, you know, the date of submission? Is it uh, close enough to the current date? You know, all of these are different things that each payer is going to have a potential of having a different subset of information that's required to actually have these, uh, you know, approved or, or rejected. So the just, good thing just, about this. Yeah, just yeah, jump please. it in here for a moment, Tim, um, just to give you all like a, a scale of what some of this looks like. We have a large client that has a business process outsourcing operation in India, and they have teams working on different uh, providers, right? Different healthcare systems, um, large pharmacies. And uh, even if you think that 90% of claims today get automated and get paid, that 10%, there are literally um, systems that have 15,000 people working on the things that can't get automated, the rejections, right? Um, another system might have 10, 11,000 people working on all of these, figuring out why this didn't get paid, right? So there is an awful lot of manual work. I mean, this this dashboard that Tim is showing you is sitting in front of thousands of people right now trying to figure out why these, these claims get paid. So this is, this is huge. There's a huge, a lot of... Uh, number of people doing this manual work today. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's where the power of AI comes in at this point, 
right? We have our rules, we've sent them through, we have the claims, they've processed through the system and we've had some issues where some of these, we know the system is tagged, these are probably going to be rejected. Now, we could read the rule, I could see that, okay, the insured ID doesn't exist, so therefore it is. But when I have this combination here, you know, where should I send, where should I, uh, you know, actually put all of my efforts in to ensuring this, one, gets approved this time, but two, I implement what I need the next time to ensure that this doesn't happen again, or I have a higher chance of catching it as it comes through again. So what we do is, is something simple in our platform is all these reports and things you're seeing are actionable. So anywhere I have these rows of data, like I do here, I could simply right click. And, and one of the actions that we developed here was a way to rectify the potential errors on that, on that uh, particular claim. Now, what this is going to do is this is actually going to take the rules that were, uh, you know, had that high probability of failure. So the data that wasn't uh, submitted properly, it has the knowledge of all of the rules that we have in our system. It has knowledge of the information that came in from the client that we're sending through. And what we do is we ask the AI model, okay, take a look at all this. And based on these denial codes we have, based on these rules we have in the system, give me an idea of what we need to do to actually rectify this. So this is that, that suggestion that AI is giving us on how to correct, correct this problem. If we do this, it's going to take just a second to spin because this is the real world. It's actually talking to an AI model here. But we can see that, that based on the data we have, AI is suggesting that it actually, it took one I saw. So for one, that we, we, we're in agreement here um, that the insured ID will doesn't exist. We need to have a, a rule there. Or in this case, we actually need to send the insured ID. So pretty straightforward. And here on this system, we could simply, you know, enter in their uh, insured ID, which obviously this is this is real. That's their actual ID number. Uh, we could hit submit here, and now that claim has been processed through, and we could see it was approved. Right, so that's that is great for onesie twosie. Right, here were the here are the the claims that went through. Here's why they were denied, and here's how I can fix it. And we can handle that using AI right from this dashboard. But what happens when you have that big batch? So you have those thousands of people sitting there typing through it, right? We, we don't, we wanna reduce that overhead. We wanna reduce the probability of human error. We wanna reduce the uh, probability of denied claims getting through. And this is where this other dashboard comes in that, that we've built up. Now here, what you're looking at is some KPIs around the claims that are processed through the system, the unrealized revenue that has been denied based on some claims that have, have been uh, rejected to us, the denial ratio. So we, we have all this at a, at a glance not only some charts here that can show the, the breakdown of which denial codes or which rejection codes were sent back to us and, and by which pair. But on the left-hand side here, we have a report of all those claims that were denied. We can see which pair they were. We have them grouped currently by that denial code. And of course, we have uh, various other things in here as well. But, you know, maybe, you know, if, we, if we're looking at a, a list like this, maybe, you know, Chris, is this, when we were talking about that, that AI correct, you know, is there, is there something that, that we could use perhaps, you know, to help us out in the future with AI when we're talking about these, these batches of claims and, and reducing that burden? Yeah, exactly. So this is where that AI correct and AI suggest is going to come into play. Uh, based on the probability that we see, depending on the denial reasons, and uh, that's a great opportunity for us to reduce the manual effort, right? So if the volume is high, if the probability is high, you know, a couple of times we can have that manual uh, uh, edits in the claim for resubmission. However, this should be an ongoing process where you take that business, you take that business rule and then make it a rule for the new submissions. So eventually what we are looking at is AI correct is going to be seamlessly reduce, cut down the manual effort that is involved and put through as a business rule so that it doesn't happen again. And then AI suggests is something still, you know, the probability is less and then there is some still some validation needs to be done. It's not qualified to be in terms of volume and the probability to be corrected automatically. So that, those are the things that still will go through the workflow. But eventually what we are seeing is once we gain that confidence level, it's going to go through that uh, the other process of applying it automatically through the through the rules engine. That's where I think this this rules engine is um, decisions as a rules engine is come in handy to facilitate all of that stuff. Even if they wanted to apply one edit, right? Tip that you can we can click on right click on that and then kind of build that edit on the go also. Correct. 
Yeah, and I really like that. So like if the the square on the right, those inference of the AI model, if those were returned from the AI suggest and AI correct, what I like is that the pairing that AI tool with a rules engine gives a chance for a human to review it so that we can make sure that we want to adopt that new rule. Tim, can you show us how that would work? Absolutely. You know, to your point, the, the model has inferred these potential issues, but we can take it that one step further where, you know, in the system, we built an action here where I can review this. And what this is going to do is the AI model is going to say, based on rules that I've seen, based on the data you have, and based on the probability of this being denied, here are some potential rules that could be added to that pair that then you could use to catch this in the future. Right. And, and these rules, you know, we're not looking at code like like you saw on a couple slides ago. We had that code and we had that that rule next to it. If we were interested in, in actually looking at this rule and seeing what it is, this is where the power of a rules engine comes in because I'm not looking at code. You know, my simple statement rule, my if then else logic simply says that if the applicable health coverage is in this particular list, then we know this is going to be approved because that's the, the set of rules that are set up at that pair to approve those types of claims. And if not, we can give it a percentage that can be used as a score and aggregated so we can see on a batch process basis, what's the probability that this is going to be denied in the future? And we can continue to tweak this along the way. I get, I know um, on the clinical side, if you stay on that that um, statement rule for a second, Tim, that we're really working to automate clinical workflows and have a view that a clinician, a subject matter expert could look at something like this to say, oh yeah, that's right. And I can read this. And so we are bridging that gap between a clinical subject matter expert and someone who is writing the code in the background to make it easier for clinical workflows. But um, Kirsch, the question for you is when we're thinking about claims management and workflows like we're discussing here, who would you think would be helping to edit those and maintain those rules for most of um, customers using a product like this? Yeah, so um, it, 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 it depends on a um, uh, couple of reasons based on the maturity of the solution, right? So obviously uh, the folks who are going to be like, you know, submitting the claims, you know, operation standpoint, they would have to look at it and then they would have to bless that. Okay, this is like you were saying, right? You know, this is you know we are sure that this edit has to be applied. So the good thing about the entire um, uh, tool here is we don't need an IT folk like you know to take this business role and then build it and then go through the whole STLC cycle. It can be one click of the button, right? Once we get an approval, once we get the blessing, then it can be a, a you know, it can, in, in business even can apply this role, you know, when the way that we build the workflow, when they, once they submit it, it gets applied uh, behind the screen. So that's the way I'm looking at how the rules can be, these rules can be applied behind the screens. Tim, anything you want to share on that as well? Uh, well I have, I'll, I'll jump in here for a minute. We, we went live uh, a couple months ago, just maybe two months with a different insurance uh, provider and they're, uh, or rather, um, they're a service company sitting between the payers and the providers, right? They, we went live with a similar model and uh, immediately within the first week or two, we were at 70% uh, automation of, of these claims. The, within, I think about four weeks, they were at 92. So you can see that with the iteration and iteration and the AI recommending what it can be, you implement it as a rule, all of a sudden, you know, your automation percentage goes up and the the manual work goes down dramatically. Okay. So it's it's a fa it, we're we're at a really fascinating time to combine the power and strength of these LLMs with traditional software tools such as a rule engine, a workflow automation. Um and there might be, uh, I was just reading some questions, which we'll get to more of um, in a moment, but uh, there was one related to, um, okay, first off, I'll say always this question comes up, right? What about um, privacy and data? And and I want to say up front, um, service providers like Microsoft, like Azure, have HIPAA compliant environments where they've you know, they've got all of the HIPAA compliance built in to their Azure 
stack. And I'm sure AWS, Google have similar services. So all the, the big providers of these tools know how important this is, and they've set up HIPAA compliant implementations of these tools. So, right. And on top of that, Gordon, from the AI perspective, and maybe Chris, you can comment on this, we would train data, data uh, train the models off of a particular customer's data so that customer's data is not shared with any other data. We're not sending this to general chat GPT in the cloud for everyone to see your your yeah, Chris, you want to comment on that a little bit too? Yeah, exactly. So, um, uh, so let me first touch upon uh, Gordon's point, right? These days, any major uh, players that you take in the in the cloud servicing, right? They are SOC two complaints, FedRAMP complaint, HIPAA complaint. So, from data security standpoint, um, you know there is there is this fundamental uh, groundwork that has been uh, already done. And obviously, uh, you know, there is always concerns about uh, using these LLMs and, you know, governing the, the bias and things like that. Definitely, that is something that has to be looked at it from data perspective, like you were saying, like, you know, you know, the same, the same kind of concern came up when, you know, we, you know, when the whole industry was uh, moving towards multi-tenant application, like what happens if I put the data, you know, if we have multi-tenant, you know, operating in the, the same environment. So, Definitely, data security concerns are there, and you know, we need to kind of uh, you know, address it based on uh, the, the client requirements and how you know, this can be governed for the specific client for the specific scenario. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Christian. I, uh, while we're at it, I think there's a, another good question came in here. The question is: Is decisions replacing, you know, a billing software or a clearinghouse edit, or uh, can it be integrated? Integrated to a billing software and pull back end data and and interact through API, and that's a great question because it's really the latter, right? Where where decisions, as I mentioned earlier, where we really sit is between the cracks. So we're not going to re replace an entire billing system, but rather sit integrate with the billing system, integrate with some data, integrate with the the large language model to do the orchestration of this because. Sometimes you pull data, you might have to format it in a certain way to send somewhere else. That's what Decisions is great at. Then we send a, we send an API message, we get the response, we may have to format it and then integrate it into your billing system, for example. So that's the power and the strength of Decisions. It's not to replace these other software applications, but rather to make them work better and to, uh, and to enhance it such that it can, it can be automated to a larger degree. Right, and to add to what you said, Gordon, um, again, you know, this is, like you said, you know, we are not replacing uh, any clearinghouse, but clearinghouse always helps in capturing some of these edits when we put through the things, but uh, this is more of taking a holistic view or helping a health system to, you know, working with multiple plans and trying to see, you know, what edits that they can build to avoid uh, subsequent uh, claim submissions. So definitely it's not- yeah, and I'll and I'll also shout out to to Krish and the Sidious Tech team in that this is what they do. They the, these guys understand this tech, all the different tech space, the tech stacks. Uh, they under they have subject matter experts that understand the process uh, to help implement tools like this uh, for automation. So by all means, if you have something and you're looking to automate it, uh, reach out to Decisions, reach out to Sidious Tech. Uh, we we work together on these kinds of problems, and uh, it takes it takes all of it. It takes the software tools, but it takes people who understand the process and understand all of these other different tech stacks. And the Sidious team have experts in in all these areas. Yeah. Um, a couple more questions. Um, you know, one question that come out again relates to uh, the hallucinations of LLMs. Right, and um, that's spot on. I talked about this retrieval augmented generation or RAG, and it's a it's a way to utilize the LLMs to do something, but restrict it to a specific document. <clears throat> so, for example, you might you might be asking, "What's the patient ID on this document?" And so you're you're asking the large language model in English this question and is specifically looking at that one document. So that's the power of this. And I think 
in the early areas of automation, that's where we found the absolute best results. In fact, at decisions, we are automating invoices that our, our suppliers send to us and doing just this, where we give the, we give all of our suppliers our email address, invoices at decisions.com. They send them. We use our own platform to pull out the invoices. We use services from Google, from OpenAI to, to uh, extract text from these documents and then uh, ask it questions. Okay, who's the, so here's our supplier list. Which one of these suppliers is, is this from, right? So we have lists, we have rules, we're combining services. And that's the magic of this is that there's no one tool that solves everything, but by combining all of these various services and integrating and orchestrating together, you can, you can achieve a level of automation that wasn't even possible a year or two years ago. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. Um, Uh, I guess we'll end with a with a you know if you were to look ahead, um, Beth, over the next five years, um, you know what do you see happening in this space in healthcare? I know that's a a, a big ask, but um... well, I can say some of the things that I hope for, um, and uh, one of the reasons I moved from clinical care, taking care of one patient at a time into the world of IT and informatics is because I believe in that power of collecting data about individual patients. So I'm collecting information about each patient, then aggregating that, patient, that data to the population level, analyzing the data at the population level, and then bringing that back to provide the best care for each individual patient. And Chris talked about this with both kind of the population and health focus that the US healthcare system is moving towards, but also this um, personalized healthcare, a little different than precision healthcare, where we're talking about the specific right cancer drug for someone with a specific genome. I'm talking about personalized healthcare, what care is the best for me, Beth Myers, when I have a conversation with my doctor and what's the best care that's recommended by all of that data for someone who has my same age, my same gender, my same situation in life, and where now I have the best suggestions from all of that data. And as a patient, I can have a conversation with my doctor to decide based off of all this best data, should I have surgery or not? What should my next goals for my health be? How should I change my diet or my exercise to improve my longevity? There's not enough good data out there to answer those questions for me particularly today. And I hope when we go five to 10 years in the future, we're able to leverage AI to clean up that data so we can answer questions like that. Um, that's my goal for healthcare little bit lofty, might take us more than five years, you know, since the last time I went to the doctor, they still asked me to fill out a paper form. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris, yourself, any, any uh, uh, thoughts on, on the world ahead? Yeah. Uh, so Beth touched upon um, the digital twins, right? So that's where I was uh, kind of, you know, being optimistic about, we see all of this data available, right? How can we get to a like more of patient engagement and at the same time personalized care. That if we combine those two elements, I think we can get ahead of the game and then get the patient more engaged into their specific treatments and follow-ups on any chronic disease and making sure that they adhere to the to their schedule of going through their diagnosis and things like that. That's where I see more of personalized care, back to what, what Beth said and also more patient engagement coming in. And also we can, you know, at some point in time, I'm hoping that we'll have enough data to model it, you know, with the data for a specific patient and predict that, hey, you know, this patient, like, you know, in, at an earlier stage, you know, should do uh, things differently in order to land up there. So that kind of predictive analysis with the large amount of data that is getting built up is what I'm hoping the next year. 
five, 10 years that we'll be marching towards. All right. Thanks, Krish. Um, I think we're almost at the hour. Um, what I'll ask everyone is if you want to learn more about the decisions platform, please reach out uh, sales at decisions.com. We'd, we'd be happy to show you how all this works and give you a live demo. Uh, Insidious Health will be at um, Del Frisco's at the Double Eagle Steakhouse in Dallas, Texas. Don't want to miss that for you carnivores out there. Uh, that's August 1st, uh, Gen AI in action. Uh, I also want to plug um, Connected Care 3.0. Um, this is coming up end of August, August 28th from 5.30 to 9 in Irvine, California. Um, and decisions, we have a webinar coming up. Uh, oh, that may have already happened. But uh, all of the webinars can be found on our website, decisions.com forward slash events. Um, on a final note, I, I will plug a book. There's a uh, AI researcher. Her name is uh, Fei Fei Li. She's a, a Chinese American origin. And the book is The Worlds I See. And uh, there's, a, there's a strong healthcare component through that, but she's, um, she's a Stanford uh, PhD. She's worked at Google for a while. She's working on uh, AI and healthcare. She was behind the ImageNet. And um, I just completed the audio book a week or two ago. Fascinating. Every other chapter is, is it's her life story interspersed with advancements in AI and, again, a strong healthcare component. So if you're in this space um, and, and want to learn what's coming and what how it all came about, a fascinating book. So on that note, uh, again, um, these will, this will be posted to our website and digital forum, and we look forward to, uh, to talking to you all soon. And I want to thank again, our co-hosts, um, Beth, Tim, and Krish. Thanks for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank Thanks, you. Gordon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. All right. Thanks everyone.